picked up over the last few Sundays, uh, our first reading really seems to be coming from the book of Acts, quite consistently, doesn't it? And, uh, you know, Acts is an interesting name for a book, isn't it? The book of Acts. You know, the Acts of the Apostles, the, the Acts of the early church, the Acts of the early believers, the Acts of the you know, We get the idea, don't we? And uh, one of the most significant things that we can observe within the early church, is not the only thing, but it's a significant thing because it's a result of something really special. It's just how rapidly that early church had grown in such a very short period of time. It just exploded and boomed and it was growing and growing. And we see within that early church something really good. And we see how the boundaries of the church are expanding and they're including this huge cross-section of people, of the church, the uh, Christianity moving beyond primarily or nearly exclusively being just a Jewish thing, just for Jewish people. It now was comprising Gentiles and, and Greeks, uh, Jewish and Gentile Greeks, and people from different nations and backgrounds. People who at one point in time would have never considered to be counted among being God's own, among God's own. But now they were, if they chose to believe, to become a disciple, a follower of God, they'd count. And it didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter where they came from. They could be as in the Gospels, we find the Samaritan group there were these this, 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 a despised people group, these, those dirty Samaritans. And yet, in Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 7, one of the disciples whom we read about, Philip, travels to Samaria, and his audience, they are Samaritans, and they are soaking in every word that Philip is proclaiming to them, declaring to them. And they're drinking it all in, and they hear about Jesus of Nazareth and the message of the kingdom of God that Jesus brought to the world and what happened. They believed. And then in Acts 10 is another really famous, great old story there too. God, in his divine way, he brings Peter and he brings Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, together. He brings them together. It's a divine arrangement. And what happens is that Cornelius' entire household, and it's not just like a family of four kind of thing that you'd see in today's day and age, but it's like... It's, it's a huge household. And he brings them together, and they're all the whole household is baptized, young and old, and they believe. And he's a Roman, no less. And then in our reading today, Philip comes across a eunuch from Ethiopia. And this eunuch, he had been to Jerusalem, and he's, and he's on his way back home, making his way back home. And uh, he had been worshiping in the temple in Jerusalem, and on his travels, there he is in his ride, in his chariot, and he's reading Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 is that passage with the suffering servant. And uh, Peter, or excuse me, Philip happens along by in a miraculous sort of way, and he overhears the words that are being read. And man, that sounds familiar to him. This sounds like this Ethiopian traveler is reading about Jesus of Nazareth. And they have a conversation. And Philip shares the good news of Jesus with this eunuch. And how does the eunuch respond? Well, they come by a body of water and look. Here is water, he says. What is standing between me from being baptized? What could stand in the way? And, well, what was Philip's response? Well, you haven't had six weeks worth of classes yet. <laughs> you know, he didn't say that. He said nothing. And he was baptized right there at that very moment. And throughout the book of Acts, we have this, this picture or this Stories of these, these glorious ragtag bunch of people from various backgrounds and cultures and dialects and, and regions and character. And God gathers them in and he's declaring them his own, recognizing them as his. And it's spectacular. And, but you know what? These things are not unique just to the books of, book of Acts and all, are they? Throughout the Gospels, when we read of Jesus traveling from place to place, person to person, people group to people, people group, we see him spreading such... A wide net, and he ate with, with, uh, and, and visited and, and socialized with outcasts, with those who were regarded as being what the written off, and he gathered with them regularly, and he had shown the love of God does not have boundaries that are defined by status or race or intellect or whatever, and the early church was simply following the lead that Jesus had established, the lead that Jesus had set up. And at the center of it really is this. 1 John 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. That sounds good, doesn't it? Even reasonable. Makes sense. We can embrace that and understand it. And then the very next verse says this. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And you know something? 
This is where I begin to quiver a little bit after verse 8, because a verse like this, it gives birth to a thought in the back of my mind and it begins to grow. It causes my brow to furrow, you know, where the eyebrows go down. And that thought begins to work its way through my mind. And it makes me think back to some, to some distant memories, maybe, some experiences that I can remember that come to mind. And eventually that thought produces a question or brings forth a question that is put right into my spirit, something for me to consider, something for me to think about that is of great importance in a form of a question. Do I really know the love of God? You see, the passage, it carries on, and it goes on to say something that presses my mind even further, uh, that the love that is to be in my heart, if from God, will allow me to know God. And that would then suggest that I am connected to God born of God and know God. And 1 John gives us something more to consider, tells us what an indicator is that the love of God is actually in us. And it says this, verse 19 to 21, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother. Well, at that point, I can stop and I can take this all at surface level or face value and say, well, you know, I'm pretty good with this then. Uh, I have two brothers and I think I'm pretty good with both of them. We get along, we talk, we enjoy one another's company. And uh, same with my sister. So I think that should settle down the issue in my mind of whether I'm born of God or no, or I know God because I, I love my brothers and I love my sister. But the thing is this, we know that the language that is being used here goes far beyond biological lines, doesn't it? We know that full well. It implies all of humanity. And that opens up a huge, wide issue for us all, I think. And you know what I'm saying, don't you? I think you know where we're going with this whole thing. Understanding this vital passage of whom we are to love. Who does it all include? And that thought that I was talking to you earlier, that it's in the back of my mind, where it begins, and it grows, and it causes me to shudder. It causes me to shake my head. And you know, if we think about it, when we think about how hard this command from God really is, we can go this way with it. Um, Haroldine kind of alluded a little bit to some of the things going on in the world. There are people groups in the world today that wreak terror. That's what they're about. They are wreaking terror on another. They fill innocent people with fear. They, they murder and they threaten and they abuse. They have exacted harm on people. They've exacted harm on fathers right before the very eyes of wives and children. And there are kidnappings of children, many being sold into slavery of one kind or another. And why? Why is that happening? Well, one of the reasons that we can say for sure it fills the pockets of evildoers. It's one thing. And I'm going to say this. I despise that our world has within it and upon it such evil. And really, really despise isn't even strong enough of I hate the evil that is in this world. I really do. I hate that such evil can be forced and exacted upon an innocent person by another person who holds more power than they. I hate that. And you know, we cannot stand in the face of evil. We're, we're not supposed to embrace the evil deeds or ignore evil deeds or even tolerate them. We're supposed to stand up for what is just. We're supposed to stand up for the innocent. Uh, for the innocent, we are supposed to to be there for the poor and for those who are broken in spirit. For those who are broken in heart, we have to be there for them. And in fact, we are told that the telltale sign that God's kingdom has arrived is when the poor are being looked after, when the hungry are being fed, when the sick are healed. In short, when the love of God is given away without reservation or expectation of return. And this is what we pray for each Sunday: Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <coughs> and we are mandated. We are mandated by God to love one another. And here's the rub. We, we are called to love those who have little or nothing, uh, who need the love of God so badly. And you know what? That's not all. We are called to love all, the innocent, the sick, and the evildoer. And in my mind, I, I think of all of those or so many who have lost so much at the hands of others, losing possessions and homes and land and property, livelihoods and even loved ones. And all these being taken away by others who, who held more power than they. 
And how does anyone move forward from things as awful as that? How do you begin to stand up again and move forward? Because for them, life is a living hell. And I wish that this didn't happen in our world today, but sadly, it does. And I shudder in my heart because of their pain, and at times even move the tears over it all. And that thought that had entered the back of my head, the back of my mind, it begins to gnaw. Gnaws away at me further because I think about this loving one another deal. Well, deal is a very poor use of words there. The challenge that it is. And then I think of it more internally, and I shudder all over again. Because of this, like I have never been through what so many of our brothers and sisters have been through globally, that around the world. Some of the things that they have had to endure. I've never been through stuff like that. I've been through much less than they, and yet I know that all too often I have failed in this whole love one another mandate that God has placed upon us. I've been moved to bitterness and anger and resentment for a whole lot less than they. And I've wanted to deal with issues in my own way where my first thought was anything, and I mean anything but love. I know what it's like to have resentment and bitterness in my heart, and I can say this, I don't like it. And listen, loving one another, I want to be clear here, it doesn't mean that we're to set up camp somewhere, a campfire, and sit around with everybody and anyone and sing Kubaya together. Maybe sometimes keeping distance from those of whom we have difficulty with or have had difficulty with, maybe distance is the most peaceable thing to do. If that's what it takes to maintain peace between one another, right? Maybe this is actually reasonable. However, we have to know what's in our hearts. We have to know our hearts. And I think the line between peace and bitterness, I don't think it's a fine line at all. When we have resentment in our hearts or bitterness and stuff like that, you know what? I think we know it. I think we know that. And this love one another, it seems more like an ideal than reality, doesn't it? And the truth is this, is that from within our own selves, we are incapable. We are incapable of this kind of love. When it comes to releasing an offender of an offense, letting it go, and again, please do not confuse with what I'm saying, is to turning a blind eye toward injustice, whether it's exacted against us or exacted against another. But I mean to let it go and not be overruled with such suppressing emotion where hate and malice begin to take deep, deep root. And we need help in this one. How badly we need Jesus in this. And this is where I think our gospel reading of today has so much to say, where Jesus says that he is the vine and that people are the branches. And we are to be free. We're to be free so that we're going to have, we can have joy, joy abundantly, and that we may have peace a life, really, that cannot be taken captive by evil. But for that to happen, the branches need to be very well connected to the vine. Abiding, living in Jesus, and Jesus living in us. And only then can lives, our lives, be fruitful, free. I read of a story, it's about a strong man at a circus, and uh, he was part of the circus act, and he took a lemon, and he grabbed it and he squeezed it for all it was worth and he squeezed and he squeezed and he squeezed until he believed that the very last drop was out and then he said to the crowd if anybody here can get it, even a drop out of this I'll give them $200 and with that little challenge this scholarly lady she gets up and very sternly makes her way to, the, to where that strong man is and she grabs that or picks up that lemon and she squeezes and she squeezes and squeezes, and finally, one drop came out. And the strong man's astounded by this. Wow. And so he gives her the $200. And he says, what is the secret of your strength? And this little lady, she says, practice. It's practice. You see, I was the treasurer of a Lutheran church for 32 years. <laughs> <laughs> Can you relate that? <laughs> She could squeeze the most from the coffers. But listen, in our inner being, who we are, inside our inner being, our heart, does not find peace by squeezing the fruit for life by ourselves. No, we receive peace when we are extensions of the mind, by choosing God, by choosing Jesus as the abiding place for our souls. 
If we want to have the fruitful life of Jesus, then our choice is to abide in him. And God's love is, is not some abstract concept. It's, it's passion, really. It's passion that is expressed in action and being fully convinced and moved by the awesome grace and mercy of God that while we are still yet sinners, Christ died for us. In verse 11 and 13 of 1 John, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And God continues to show us love through Jesus' life-giving presence among us. And if we should ever question whether God truly loves us, the gift and witness of the Holy Spirit will confirm it over and over and over again that we are His, that we are God's beloved. And God's love is a basic proof, more basic and reliable than the ground that you're going to walk on and in the air that you're going to breathe. The more fully and completely we know God, the more the immense reality of God's love begins to take over in us. It begins to dawn on us. And it begins to wash away things that plague us. It begins to wash away clouds of, of bitterness. It begins to remove resentment and so forth. And the more we are enabled to see things differently, the more that we'll be able to see people differently. Without the lenses of stereotype or judgment, but through the lenses of the Holy Spirit and see the beauty of God in all kinds of people, all kinds of people that maybe are often overlooked. There's a story that I'll never forget. And again, it's a story that I've told here a few years back. But it was told by a fellow by the name of Brian Bueller. That may be a familiar name to some of you. Brian is uh, Johnny Bueller's uh, nephew. And for years, uh, Brian had been senior pastor of the North Shore Alliance Church in Vancouver, and, and he's really an outside-the-box thinker. And he had an idea that came to him, and he shared it with two of his staff members, and he invited them to share it in an experience with him. And this is what it was. They were going to spend a night in East Vancouver, the East Hastings Corridor, which is an area that is very well known for drug trafficking and all sorts of other things. And they would dress as street people, and live on the street for 12 hours. And these two colleagues listened to this idea, and they decided, yeah, we'll do this with you. We'll go. And so on one afternoon, late afternoon, they boarded a ferry, and they set across that, that beautiful piece of water that separates North Bank from downtown Vancouver. And they got off the ferry, and they made their way to the East Quarter, and they're dressed as street people. And it was nearly the dinner hour by the time they arrived. And they're unshaven, and they're looking as trying to have the look of a street person as much as they could. And being that it was near the dinner hour, the dinner hour they, tried, they decided they're going to try to pan him and scrounge up some cash for some food, for some supper. And that proved to be unsuccessful for them. And they saw something that, that sounded to me like Union Mission, Union Gospel Mission, like a soup kitchen idea, right? Where food was being offered to the homeless. And they entered that building and they were led into a large meeting room and there they heard the gospel being preached and being sung. And from there, they were led into another room, and it was like a dining hall. Well, it was a dining hall, and there they were given a warm meal that would fill their bellies. And staff members of that place, of that mission, served them and talked with them and showed them kindness and showed them warmth, the love of God. Well, they left that mission, and it was getting late, and so they decided, well, now it's time to try to find a place to stay for night. And throughout the evening, they were witness of many things. People going through various experiences, drug experiences is another. They saw vans pull up and handing out clean needles. And it was really an eye-opening experience for them. And as it's getting late, they came across another establishment. I believe it was called Crosswalk. And this is all of 15 years ago now. And they entered the building and they were warmly received. And they were led to a room where they could lie down. And before the lights were put out, they were prayed for. And a man prayed that as they would sleep, that they would be free of bad dreams. And again, the love of God being given away to them. And in the morning, it was time to head back to the ferry. They had done their 12 hours. They had done their time. And after leaving Crosswalk, well, we know what happens in Vancouver quite often. It's raining. And they're in the rain. And they saw a Starbucks. And Brian is, is a, he loves coffee. And he says, hey, let's go over there. He had a $20 bill tucked in his shoe. Let's get out of the rain, let's have some coffee. 
And while they're waiting in line for coffee, there's a lady in front of them, and she takes notice of them standing behind her. And she, they discover that she was an exotic dancer. She finished her shift and time for coffee. And as she looked at them, she begins to pick up with them and talk, talk with them. And then she stopped and said to them, are you poor? And at that point, Brian had said, or one of them had said, well, actually, no, we're, we're not poor. We're just pretending to be poor. And she, that didn't really stand. And she said, you know, it's okay to be poor. And then she turned around to the, to the clerk, to the, whoever was taking the cash, and she said, I want to buy, I would like a coffee, and I'd like three of more coffees. I want to buy coffees for my new friends. And then they sat together, and she began to share her life with them. And of all the things, uh, about an event that she was going to, well, she's going to a funeral that afternoon of a friend of hers that had overdosed. And her heart was broken, and she was pouring it out. But what we see here is more than just one person pouring out her heart to another. We also see her pouring out love on them. We see it going both ways here. And for 12 hours after they had left and departed one another's company, for 12 hours, Brian and his friends received a message that was so very loud and clear to them that after receiving the love of God so freely and from all kinds of people too, the limitless love of God is not confined to culture, it's not confined to background or ethnicity or even life circumstances. The love of God will reach to anyone and everyone. Whatever path you are on, God will find you. And he offers peace that passes all understanding. Peace that would seem to be impossible to have in various times of life, during some of life's most trying circumstances. The love of God will open your eyes up to see, to see people differently. As people God so dearly loves. And the lesson, and that really what it does is it lessens the pain that we sometimes feel from the hurt that we have experienced. And it allows us to lift up our heads and smell a brand new day and know in our hearts this, that I will not be overcome. I will not be overcome because my Savior lives. He's in my heart and I know Him. And I can be at peace. So Lord, we say, Lord, you have my heart and I will search for yours. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. You have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be you a sacrifice. And I will praise you. Now, and tomorrow, and evermore. Amen? Amen. Well, let's stand and say it as we go to communion, as we are reminded all over.